Hello and welcome. I am Dr. Lara May, a clinical pharmacist specializing in functional medicine, as well as a certified yoga teacher and Reiki master. I run a truly integrative health coaching practice, encompassing functional medicine lab testing, yoga and meditation, and a sprinkling of Reiki energy medicine. Join me here on Light Body Radio to break through your health plateau and come into alignment with your natural vitality. Hello and welcome to another episode of Light Body Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Lara May, and today I want to talk to you about dairy. Now, some of you may have a long and loving relationship with your creamer or your milk with your cereal in the morning, or um, maybe it's your ice cream or whatever form of dairy, it could be even cheese that uh, you choose to partake in and have part of your regular eating habits. But I would like to just give you a little taste of the truth about dairy and you can take it or leave it. But I will say for myself, when I finally let go of the dairy in my life, my health got phenomenally better. I was able to finally get rid of all my chronic allergies. I got rid of this chronic mucusy gook that I always had hanging out in the back of my throat. Um, My skin cleared up. I no longer had this cyclical acne problem that I just couldn't seem to get rid of. So there were a lot of things personally for me that improved when I finally let go of the dairy. And it was hard for me because for me, like I enjoyed, you know, milk in my coffee or tea and, um, you know, I enjoyed ice cream every now and then. But for me, it was cheese. Cheese was my love affair. And every now and then I was still let myself have some cheese, but overall I have released the dairy from my life and I want to talk to you about why and maybe with a little bit of um, extra knowledge under your belt, you will consider your own relationship with dairy. So what if I told you that your relationship with dairy, the milk that you think is so good for you and your bones is actually contributing to the deterioration of your bones, your organs, and your waistline. And yes, I'm even talking about skim milk. At this point, I also want to point out that I am specifically talking about factory farmed dairy. So that is dairy that is pasteurized and processed and contains a whole bunch of hormones and added chemicals and it's fortified with vitamins for a very specific reason. But And I'll go into all this, but I just want to point out that for my raw dairy farmers that I love and for the people out there that consume raw dairy, um, this is not part of that. So there are two things that make cow's milk products so bad. First, the protein molecule in cow's milk is really difficult for the human body to break down, which means it will leave waste residue in the body and it'll really pile up if you consume it regularly. Remember, cow's milk was designed for baby cows, not humans. Also, uh, the milk is pasteurized. So any good attributes it might have had when it came out of the cow, even if the cow was raised in the best way possible, has now been cooked out of it and killed. So, however... Butter and cream, since they don't contain this uh, casein-heavy protein, are much easier to break down and are still acceptable for you in small quantities. And so if you're a bulletproof style eater or a paleo person, um, then definitely you can still have your ghee and your grass-fed butter. So... um, You know, if you feel adventurous, I encourage you to maybe start looking into making your own nut milk. Um, But a little bit more about why cow's milk and dairy um, should probably be avoided. 
In order for calcium to be properly absorbed and not leached from your bones, magnesium has to be present. Dairy products actually contain very little magnesium. So as an alternative, I encourage you to ramp up your intake of leafy greens, which contain both calcium and magnesium in the perfect ratio for all, all sorry, I can't speak today, <laughs> optimum calcium absorption. Despite the fact that American women have been consuming an average of two pounds of milk per day for their entire lives, according to the National Institute of Disability Research, it is estimated that 30% of postmenopausal Caucasian women in the U.S. have osteoporosis of the spine, hips, or arms. That's pretty staggering. So if milk is so great for us, then why are so many women still suffering from, from osteoporosis? Now, granted, osteoporosis is a complicated process, and it's not just about your intake, but it is a big factor. Another reason that you should probably uh, start to put some distance between yourself and your favorite dairy product is all of the growth hormones and antibiotics that are injected into the cows to produce milk enter directly into our bloodstream and then we consume the milk products which means we also consume these hormones and antibiotics and if you think that these don't have a uh, systemic effect on you and your health, you unfortunately are sorely mistaken. So that could be another reason why so many people start to feel so much better once they get rid of the dairy in their lives. Milk is one of the most mucus forming foods that we can consume. It should be, it should come as no surprise that American children suffer to such a great extent of asthma, allergies, ear infections, and, and colds, and they're reared on formula, cow's milk, dairy-rich diets, and their bodies become laden with mucus buildup in just a few short years. Dr. Christian Northrup states, dairy is a tremendous mucus producer and a burden on the respiratory, digestive, and immune systems. She says when patients, quote, eliminate dairy products for an extended period and eat a balanced diet, they suffer less from colds and sinus infections. Now, again, I can speak to this personally. I was raised on cow's milk, the, you know, most typical skim milk that you can find in a grocery store. I, you know, I really enjoyed it, but I also had chronic sinus infections, which bought me at least one, if not two rounds of antibiotics every single year and this went on all the way from I think I started having ear infections when I was two and I had chronic sinus infections all the way up until when I gave up dairy which was in I think 2014. So from 2014 to 1982 I was drinking milk, having chronic sinus infections, always plugged up with mucus and snotty. I had chronic post-nasal drip, all of these things so inflammatory. And it was just so simple when I gave up the dairy, so much of it cleared up. So I really want you to think about this if you're out there and you're suffering with any sort of any of these, you know, chronic inflammatory things. It might be asthma. Um, it might be chronic allergies, or maybe it's even seasonal allergies. If it's even seasonal allergies, I would challenge you to give up dairy during these times where you know you're going to have flare-up and see if your flare-up is even just the slightest bit less intense. Did you know that dairy can also block iron absorption, resulting in a reduced red blood cell count, which causes anemia? So if you're one of the many women out there that are suffering with an iron deficiency anemia, I would also, that's another reason on our list to think about um, eliminating dairy from your diet because if you're trying to rebuild the iron in your blood then that calcium that is in the dairy is actually going to in uh, fight for the absorption in your GI tract preventing the iron from being absorbed. Pasteurized dairy intake is also linked with thyroid conditions and diabetes and um, this is mainly um, in terms of diabetes it's really linked to all the lactose sugar so again like we already mentioned the growth hormones and there are so many other contaminants that the uh, factory farm 
cows either absorb or expose to or maybe they're fed GMO corn and so that GMO corn as it's ingested and metabolized in them is definitely affects the milk that they excrete that then now you are consuming which is causing inflammation throughout your body. So the most healthful sources of calcium are leafy green vegetables like kale, dandelion, Swiss chard, and these are highly absorbable forms of calcium. So just remember that you don't have to have dairy to get your calcium. And like I mentioned earlier, the dairy that is out there on your grocery shelf is not does not have enough magnesium in it for it to truly be absorbed correctly. So um, I don't know if you're taking a magnesium supplement, but I would encourage you next time you go to your doctor, have your magnesium levels tested. Make sure you have enough magnesium in your body. If not, talk to your doctor or healthcare provider about a magnesium supplement. And again, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Um, eat your leafy greens because that's where you get lots of calcium and magnesium and iron as well, since we talked about having some iron deficiency anemia. Um, so that's all about the dairy today. I hope this just gives you some information and stuff to think about. And I also want to talk about today pH balance and alkalinity in the body. So the balance of acid and alkalinity within the body is referred to as the pH. And it is measured on a scale ranging from 1 to 14, 1 being acidic and, P and 14 being alkaline or basic. A neutral pH, which is right in the middle, is um, for the human body is 7.35 or 7.4. And maintaining this balance is vital. And our bodies do an amazing job with maintaining this, uh, this balance for us through a system called the buffer system. But if we eat a diet that is super high in acidic foods, then this can overwork the body with that or eventually just overcome it and we can have a more acidic pH within our body. An acidic environment within the body negatively affects our health at the cellular level. And again, this comes back to inflammation. And it's not possible to be truly healthy when the body is in a constant state of acidosis, which is a state of being too acidic. So people with an acidic environment within their body are also prone to fatigue. Since acidity is a stressor, cortisol levels, dry, cortisol levels rise and um, sleep is impaired. And it's just a trickle down effect from there in terms of the ramp up of inflammation in your body. The consumption of acid forming foods is the number one cause of an overly acidic system. And the overconsumption of acid forming foods plays a significant role in one of North America's largest health care health problems, which is excessive weight. Since our body is equipped with buffering capabilities, our blood pH will vary only a small, a small degree regardless of our diet. The body's ability to cope is a testament to how resourceful it is. It's really amazing. Yet the systems that are recruited to facilitate this buffering use valuable energy and become strained and if prolonged, like I mentioned earlier, will result in significant stress, which will cause the immune system to fall below its maximum efficiency and it can eventually lead to a host of other disease diseases an acidic body can lead to a plethora of health problems but another big one is that viruses and bacteria are able to thrive in an acidic environment so this can also lead to increased instances of colds flus different types of infections and can um also possibly increase your risk for cancer if left unchecked, according to some studies. So what can we do to prevent this? Because you know, I never like to just give you guys all bad news. I really am here to give you tools. And so the answer obviously is to consume more alkaline forming foods and fewer acid forming ones. So one factor that significantly raises the pH of food, so if you're raising the pH towards 14, then you're making it more basic, you're making it more alkaline, so that's what we want. And in turn, raising the pH in your body is chlorophyll. 
So chlorophyll is what gives plants their green color. So keep that in mind. Chlorophyll is often referred to as the blood of the plants. The botanical equivalent to hemoglobin in our blood, chlorophyll synthesizes energy for the plants. Chlorophyll converts the sun's energy that has been absorbed by the plant into carbohydrates that the plants use. This is called photosynthesis. I apologize if I'm getting a little science geeky out, but um, in a former life, I was a grower at a huge greenhouse, and um, so I have a very uh, soft spot in my heart for plants and a little bit of botany, so bear with me here. <laughs> Chlorophyll is also linked to the body's production of, um, our body's production of red blood cells. So making daily consumption of chlorophyll rich foods is super important for ensuring the body's constant cell regeneration and improving oxygen transport in our bodies and therefore our energy levels. Optimizing the body's regeneration of blood cells will also contribute to peak athletic performance if that's something that you're working towards. It's always something that I seem to be constantly striving for. So although some foods test as, as acidic, they produce an alkalizing effect once digested. For example, citrus fruits and balsamic and apple cider vinegar are all technically acidic if you were to test them with a uh, pH stick, but when consumed, they become highly alkaline forming. So that's important to keep in mind too. So I'm going to run through a list of vegetables that are highly alkaline forming, so you'll have something to work from. Asparagus, beets, bell peppers, broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, celery, chicory, cucumbers, dill, green beans, leeks, all leafy mixed greens, onions, parsley, parsnips, peas, sea vegetables, all sprouts, and zucchini. These are all vegetables that are highly alkaline forming. So when you eat them as they're di digested in your body, they will benefit your pH and help you um, lean towards a more alkaline pH. Here are some fruits that are highly alkaline forming. Grapefruits, lemons, limes, mangoes, papaya, and melons. And then the next list I'm going to read to you are alkaline forming foods. Apples, avocados, bananas, most berries, cantaloupe, cherries, dates, figs, grapes, nectarines, orange, peaches, pears, persimmons, pineapple, and pomegranates. So that is a pretty comprehensive list of both vegetables and fruits that are either highly alkaline forming or alkaline forming to help you um, sort of point you in the right direction as to what foods you can start implementing in your diet today to start moving your uh, body pH towards a more balanced alkaline number. Most modern diets, unfortunately, are based on acid-forming foods, which really results in a stress response in your body and contributes to inflammation, which then contributes to the manifestation of disease um, in our body in some way, shape, or form. And of course, it's different for everyone, but we are bombarded with stress responses all day long. I feel like we shouldn't be adding to it with the food that we're putting in our body. So let's make some good choices. And not all the foods that you eat have to be alkalizing, but the more that you can plug in and add in to your daily consumption, the better off you'll be. So I want to take a moment also to talk about proteins and pH. Um, you, if you might know, maybe you don't know, proteins are composed of amino acids. So obviously the word acid is in amino acid and that's what makes up protein. So that's going to have some effect on your pH, one would logically deduce, right? So protein rich foods, um, as you might expect, are more acid forming. However, there are three questions you can ask in order to select the ones with the highest pH. Again, that's the most alkaline and the most basic, which is what we're aiming for. So first, has the food been processed? You should be asking this with, you know, when you're trying to figure out what you should choose anyway, because in general, you want to eat the least amount of processed food 
processed foods possible. But in terms of this whole pH balance, alkalinity issue, has if the food has been processed, then it is most likely going to be more acid forming because most common processing of protein involves isolating it. And this is done by removing the carbohydrate and the fat and creating protein isolates. Whey and soy protein powders are two types of protein isolates. So think about that too next time you're looking maybe for a um, protein supplement. If you see the word isolate, you really want to stay away from it because it's just going to add to the acidity uh, uh, within your body. The isolation process involves high temperatures and usually chemicals. And this, the resulting protein will have a significantly lower pH and then, than it did before. And like I said, will be acid forming. So the second question that you can ask yourself is, is the protein raw? Cooking protein can make it more acid forming. Since pasteurization is a form of cooking, it is best to select unpasteurized sources of protein, which would be um, raw. So raw is best. But if the protein needs to be pasteurized to kill the bacteria, be sure that it is flash pasteurized only. Flash pasteurization is a process by which the protein is heated just long enough to reduce the proliferation of harmful bacteria, but not long enough to significantly affect the protein quality and structure. So the first two questions consider the food's manufacturing. The less altered by processing and cooking, the better. So again, is it processed and is it cooked or raw? The third question is, does the protein source contain chlorophyll? We already talked about chlorophyll and how great it is. Since chlorophyll is very alkalizing, the protein containing it will have a high pH. An easy way to determine chlorophyll content is to look at the color. Is it green? And you probably are thinking protein and meat, but don't forget about your plant-based protein. So that's why you're going to look to see if your protein is green. If your meat is green, please don't eat it. That's probably really bad. <laughs> so um, hemp and many types of peas, legumes, dark green leafy vegetables, and seaweeds, although high in amino acids and therefore protein, are also high in chlorophyll pH balancing, and really good for you. So natural proteins with a relatively high pH include sprouts, um, and these could be any kind of sprouts from nuts, seeds, and legumes, algae such as chlorella and spirulina, grasses such as wheat, oat, and barley, and cooked legumes, though cooked legumes are not as alkaline forming as sprouted legumes. Flax seeds are also in there and as well as hemp. Hemp protein, for example, is not isolated and so remains in a relatively natural state, retaining its alkalinity. Hemp protein is one of my favorites um, to make a protein shake with, like after a workout or something. I really like it. It also has a great taste. And it's one of the uh, few complete plant proteins, meaning like it has all of your essential amino acids in there. You don't have to um, search out for extra sources of amino acids when you um, consume hemp. So daily consumption of protein with a relatively high pH will help you maintain your body's acidity and alkalinity. A diet high in leafy green vegetables will also help you ensure that you maintain this balance. So, so far today, I've given you um, two different little smidgens of topics to, and both have come back around to leafy greens. So now let's talk a little bit, just a little bit, I promise, about um, what these acid forming foods do uh, in relation to your digestion. So when, when you consume acid forming foods, they produce toxins that the body must deal with. And how does your body do that? Well, once they get absorbed, then they have to go through your liver. So it's a pretty big stress to your liver. Refined and processed foods, as you know, are highly acid forming and devoid of any usable nutrients, but they retain their caloric value. 
So this is why if you lived on a diet of fast food, you would probably be overweight, but you would still on paper and according to your body's chemistry, be malnourished because there is no nutri- nutritional value in that food whatsoever, even though it's well endowed with lots of calories. Denatured foods. So denatured foods would be like those that are cooked. And so denatured means like the the protein and the enzymes are um, no longer functional or in their original structure. So denatured foods not only instantly create an acidic environment within the body because of their chemical composition, but they also contain toxins leading to premature aging through cell degeneration. Most prescription drugs, artificial sweeteners, and synthetic vitamin and mineral supplements are also highly acid forming, which is also why it's so important to make sure if you're taking vitamins and supplements to make sure they're coming from a a good reputable source because you don't want to be adding to your problem or to your not doing yourself the very best that you possibly could be doing. Let's just go in that direction. As the body carries out normal functions, such as movement and digestion, it naturally becomes increasingly acidic. Acid formation is a natural byproduct of a healthy metabolism. I'm sure like when you work out, you notice that you're sore, that soreness in your muscles is caused by lactic acid production. So this normal biological function becomes a problem only when an inordinate amount of food is consumed and our body can't swing back the other way. So I want to wrap it up, but first I want to just sort of like bring it all together for you today. Diet or what you eat has the greatest impact on your body's pH level. So, um, you know, granted, you know, there are other contributing things that can definitely uh, skew it to one side or the other, but eating the best possible alkalizing food to help yourself out and decreasing your dairy intake, eating lots of leafy greens, all of these things can help you maintain a good middle of the road pH balance, which will help your body have less inflammation and will be less stressed, and will be more healthy. So I mentioned um, apple cider vinegar earlier as one of those foods that is, um, it's highly alkaline forming, even though it's an acidic food. So um, if you're, I encourage you to do some more research on your own about apple cider vinegar. But one of the things that really helped me when I was actively working on healing my GI tract Um, when I was suffering from SIBO and chronic heartburn and IBS is um, a apple cider vinegar tonic in the morning, first thing in the morning. So what I would do is I would get, um, I would pour out a shot of raw apple cider vinegar unfiltered. And I use the Bragg's brand, but any raw unfiltered apple cider vinegar you can find, I'm sure is is fine. Um, But don't shoot it straight because (laughs) that's really gross. Um, Just so take the shot and pour it into some warm water and add some lemon. Remember, lemon was also on the list of highly alkaline forming foods. Um, It was under the fruits list that I gave you. So combine that. And then if you still need to cut it with something after you dilute it with the warm water and add a little lemon, add a spoonful of raw honey as well as long as you're not allergic, of course. And so do this every morning. And this can really help soothe your stomach and um, start to heal your GI tract. Ironically enough, having a um, having a lack of acid in your stomach can often contribute to you having heartburn or some of these um, gut issues. So adding in this um, little bit of acidity that helps balance everything out can really help to heal and to counteract these, um, not only the symptoms, but actually the source. Apple cider vinegar contains prebiotics. And those are indigestible carbs that help balance your gut microbiome and keep the bad guys like H. pylori in check. 
So um, try that if you're um, battling or suffering with any sort of um, GI indigestion or anything like that. Try it out. Um, It's super easy, super quick to do in the morning. Again, do it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. It's really nice and soothing, I think, um, as a warm beverage. And do it for a month and just see if you notice any difference. I definitely did, and it really helps me along along with the whole big, huge other regimen of things I was doing, but it was definitely a key aspect. So um, today we talked about getting rid of dairy and why, and then we talked about um, pH and um, acidity and alkalinity in your body and also in your gut. So today was kind of a mishmash, but I hope that you're able to walk away with some tools that you can implement and maybe at least just some knowledge to get you thinking and asking questions. I hope you have a fabulous day and a fabulous week to come. I'll catch up with you later.